can get started. Welcome to today's webinar, CANS Treatment Decisions in Older Adults with Multiple Chronic Conditions. This webinar series is coordinated by the Aging Initiative, which is an NA-funded initiative that bridges the expertise and leadership of two powerhouses for research on multiple chronic conditions. The two powerhouses are the Healthcare Systems Research Network and the Claude D. Pepper Older Americans Independent Centers, or Pepper Centers. The initiative is led by Dr. Jerry Gerwitz at University of Massachusetts and Myers Primary Care Institute. Along with OPI is Elizabeth Bayless and a magaziner. My name is Heather Whitson. I'm a geriatrician and investigator at Duke University, and I'm part of the Aging Initiative Dissemination Work Group, which is co-led by Leah Hansen at Health Partners. Before we get started, I need to cover just a few technical details. Number of registrants for today's webinar, we've placed the phone lines on mute to reduce audio feedback. So unless you are logged in as a host or a panelist, your line will be muted. However, we welcome and encourage audience participation using the Q&A and chat features of the webinar software. If your Cisco webinar portal, under the that says presentation, you can look to the upper right and you should see an icon for chat and an icon for Q&A. If you have questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Leah will be keeping an eye out for those questions under the Q&A icon. As permits, she will read the questions for our speakers after the presentation. If you have technical or logistical questions, we ask that you submit those using the chat function. Please ensure that you're identified either by your name or your participant ID so that the webinar hosts are able to help troubleshoot any problem that you're having with audio or other issues. With this function, you can choose whether you would like your comment to be visible to all participants, or you can choose to send the question just to the host. We huge thanks to Catherine, to Catherine Anzoni and Valentina Boulay at the, primary, at, at the Myers Primary Care Institute. They amazing work behind the scenes to make these webinars possible. We'll be monitoring the chat functions throughout the call today to help with the technical troubleshooting. And to go ahead and introduce both of our day's speakers. The first speaker will be Talika Garg. Dr. Garg is a Euro, Euro, Eurologic Oncologist and Health Services Researcher at Geisinger Health System, a rural community-based health system in central Pennsylvania. A graduate of Baylor College of Medicine, she completed her general surgery internship and urology residency at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She completed a urologic oncology fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and concurrently earned an MPH at the Harvard School of Public Health while on an NCI T32 urologic oncology training grant. Dr. Chich's clinical practice focuses on surgical treatment of superficial and invasive bladder cancer in medically complex rural older adults. Inspire patients. Her goal is to help older adults adults with black cancer and multiple chronic conditions make personalized treatment decisions that account for the whole patient. Our next speaker today is Dr. R.T. Huria. Dr. Huria is a geriatrician and oncologist and is Vice Provost of Clinical Faculty and Director of the Center for Cancer and Aging at City of Hope. The overall goal of Dr. Huria's research program is to improve the care of adults with cancer. Dr. Huria's leadership the Care and Aging Research Program has developed and executed over 24 geriatric oncology protocols, including over 3,200 participants on studies focused on cancer and aging. Dr. Curia is a principal investigator on six NIH-funded grants and has received research support for the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, Uni Foundation, and Hearst Foundation. Dr. Curia leads national and international efforts to improve the care of older adults with cancer. Served on the Institute of Medicine Committee on Improving the Quality of Cancer Care, Assessing the Challenges in an Aging Population. Dr. Chess serves as editor in chief for the Journal of Geriatric Oncology. She's a recipient of the B. D. Kennedy Award for the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which recognizes scientific excellence in geriatric oncology. Dr. Curio was elected to the Board of Directors for the American Society of Clinical Oncology in 2016. In 17, Dr. Curio was the recipient of an endowed chair in geriatric oncology, the George Psy Geriatric Oncology Chair, and the recipient of the International Society of Geriatric Oncology Paul Cabrisi Award. Uh, 
again for your participation in today's webinar. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. Can, can you see my slides? Not no. Okay. Okay. okay, great. Um, to the Aging Dissemination Work Group for the opportunity to present our work um, on our aging pilot project. Um, I'm hugely thankful to the Aging Initiative for funding this work and also to my wonderful mentors and collaborators um, who are hugely instrumental in this project. About the silver tsunami of cancer care, the elderly population is going to double by the year 2030, um, and there will be um, 72 million new cancer diagnoses in older adults by 2030. 6% um, of those uh, cancer diagnoses will be in those over 65, uh, and accounting for 70% of all cancer deaths. 85 year olds are the fastest growing segment, and they will triple by 2030. Uh, which is what I typically work on, are highly prevalent. Of the top 10 cancers, urologic cancers are three of them, uh, prostate at number three, bladder at number five, and kidney cancer is number nine. Uh, urologic cancer patients are 25% of all cancer survivors and, um, all, and constitute 40% of all cancers in men. Their cancer incidence is projected to increase by 54% by the year 2030. The majority of older cancer patients have multiple chronic conditions, and the Department of Health and Human Services defines multiple chronic conditions as the presence of two or more conditions that last over one year and that require ongoing medical attention and or limit activities of daily living. And cancer is a very important chronic condition. Um, approximately 90% of Medicare patients in one study with, who had cancer met criteria for MCC. And it has huge impacts on older cancer patients in terms of treatment decision making, healthcare utilization and treatment burden, quality of life, and as well, many of them um, require caregivers to help them get through diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship. Super bladder cancer, which is what most of my clinical practice is, is really an ideal cancer for examining the interplay between multiple chronic conditions and cancer treatment. Bladder cancer in general has the highest median age diagnosis of 73 years. Smoking is the main modifiable risk factor for bladder cancer. About 50% of bladder cancers are associated with smoking, and so many of these patients have smoking-related multiple chronic conditions. We recently studied urologic cancer patients in our health system and found that bladder cancer patients have a median of eight chronic conditions. Bladder cancer, especially superficial bladder cancer, has a very high recurrence rate, but it has a low risk of death. It requires frequent surveillance and treatment with invasive cystoscopy procedures, um, and it also requires frequent ambulatory surgery for those recurrences, which requires anesthesia. And muscle invasive bladder cancer has been highly studied in terms of the older population, but superficial disease is actually much more common. Um, it's 75% of new diagnoses. And um, because of the high recurrence rate, it is highly burdensome. Bladder cancer also has the highest cost from diagnosis to death of all cancer sites. And while we have a lot of data that suggests that treatment for superficial bladder cancer reduces the risk of recurrence and progression. Very little is known about whether it actually, whether treatment actually impacts death. This is just a, a diagram of uh, of the bladder and um, how bladder cancer is staged. And um, superficial bladder cancer consists of tumors that are T1, TA, TIS. Um, and then this is just a picture of what a tumor typically looks like uh, when it is seen in the bladder. We have significant lack of information for decision-making in our older adults with cancer. Um, there's very limited 
enrollment of older medically complex patients in clinical trials, and especially in bladder cancer, um, even though the median age of diagnosis is 73, most of the trials enroll patients that are 10 years younger. Um, there are significant gaps in terms of whether it's um, an association between cancer treatment and outcomes. And then this lack of data leads to variation in treating older patients. It can result in either under or over treatment. What we see in, in my clinic frequently, and these are all questions that my patients have asked me at some point. They ask me how bad they're going to feel after their treatment, what it, how it's going to impact their ability to be independent, um, many of them have spouses and caregivers who are who are equally or if not more sick than they are, um, and they may be the primary caregiver for somebody else. Um, it affects their adult children. They have lots of appointments. And I typically have to make these decisions within a 10-minute clinic appointment, and the guidelines are often not very helpful in terms of, of guiding these patients. Um, Looking at the NCCN guidelines for um, for older adult oncology, um, there is a section on bladder cancer, but there are very few recommendations um, because there is very little little literature to guide how we um, advise patients on treatments in this population. The of of, uh, of my pilot project was to estimate the association between standard superficial bladder cancer treatment and 10-year mortality among older adults uh, while adjusting for multiple chronic conditions and other confounders. And so our goals were really to understand the impact of treatment for superficial bladder cancer on overall survival in an older cohort, and then to understand what, those, what the trade-offs with multiple chronic conditions might be. We performed a retrospective cohort study in two community-based health systems, Geisinger and Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente Northwest, and we did to uh, superficial bladder cancer patients who had HACC stage of less than or equal to one. We looked at the years 2003 to 2014, and we concentrated on the older population, and they had to have um, they had to be 60 years or older at the time of diagnosis. We were able to identify a total of 1,800 patients for our analysis. Uh, we divided our uh, our uh, cohort into two groups, a treat and observation group. We defined superficial bladder cancer treatment based on CPT codes uh, for the most common treatments for superficial bladder cancer. And superficial bladder cancer is usually treated um, by a transurethral resection of bladder tumor, or TURBT, and the codes for that are listed there, um, and um, also um, for uh, patients with high-grade disease or carcinoma in situ, um, they're also treated with um, with treatment that goes directly into the bladder and intravascular treatment, and they are listed there for that. Um, and we define treatment as receiving um, one or both of those treatments within six months of diagnosis. Uh, in terms of measuring multiple chronic conditions, we extracted all ICD-9 codes that were attached to all clinical encounters, ranging from inpatient all the way out to problem lists and procedures. We applied two different tools, the AHRQ Chronic Condition Indicator and the AHRQ Clinical Classification Software. And in order for a patient to, have a, uh, to be defining a condition, they had to have three outpatient or one inpatient code within a calendar year. And we had 48 different chronic conditions um, prior to starting the study um, based on a review of the literature and the AHRQ MCC chart book. And we used MCC as a binary variable and defined it as having two or more chronic conditions. We also for a few other covariates, um, including age of diagnosis, sex, race, ethnicity, body mass index, smoke status, um, as, sm as smoking is one of the main risk factors for bladder cancer. Um, and we also looked at health system. And then we created a combined variable for AJCC stage and grade as the prognosis for um, recurrent progression is dependent on a combination of the stage in terms of how deeply into the bladder wall the tumor is invading and the grade, whether it's a low grade or high grade tumor. Uh, descriptive statistics, 
Um, and um, then we performed a Cox proportional hazards model and truncated data at 10 years. Um, and we also performed a propensity score analysis. And we used um, standardized inverse probability of treatment weights to balance our covariates, as there were quite a few differences between our two groups. Um, and we used um, IPTW in particular for the following reasons. Um, it was used to balance our covariates. Um, it can be used for survival analysis. Um, and it reduces loss of information due to lack of matching. And then we standardized um, IPTW um, in order to preserve our sample size because it stabilizes the outlier propensity scores, the ones that are very low and very high. We identified 1,800 patients from our two health systems. Uh, we had 1,485 patients in our treatment group and 315 patients in our observation group. And the median follow-up time for the entire cohort was 6.6 .6 years. These baseline characteristics of our cohort and comparisons between our treatment and observation groups. There are significant differences in mean age, sex, and race between our two groups. Uh, however, we did find that Geisinger patients were less likely to receive treatment, and those who did receive treatment were more likely to be obese, more likely to be current or former smokers, more likely to have multiple chronic conditions, and were likely to be alive at 10 years. We also found that patients receiving treatment tended to have high-grade disease or higher-stage disease. It's our um, Kaplan-Meier curve for the entire cohort. We um, comparison looking at the Kaplan-Meier curve um, stratified by treatment group, um, so treatment and observation. Uh, the median survival for the entire cohort was 7.8 years, and our median survival time for the observation group was 6.8 years, and the median survival time for treatment group was 8.2 years. Um, and while there wasn't a, a significant difference in our log rank um, value, um, the treatment group did survive um, a little bit longer. Um, we then performed um, the propensity score analysis. Um, we found that, um, that the causal association between treatment and mortality using SIPTW to balance a sample um, we found 23% reduction in the risk of death with a hazard ratio of 0.77. Um, we then performed a doubly robust analysis by entering um, the SIPTW variable for treatment into our COX model, and that's what's demonstrated here. Um, and our results were consistent with clinical context. Uh, we found that increasing age was associated with increased hazard of death. Uh, we found that females had a lower risk of death. There were no significant differences between um, center and race ethnicity, um, and higher stage disease had an increased hazard of death. Um, and while um, treatment remained consistent in terms of its decreased hazard of death, um, we did find that MCC at baseline had outweighed that hazard um, by um, a hazard of death that was 76% higher. Exclude um, body mass and Index um, and smoking status, as they were highly associated with the other variables in in our model. Our has some strengths and limitations. Uh, the main strengths are that we were able to utilize data from two uh, large community-based health systems that are geographically disparate, urban and rural, uh, and we were able to evaluate the outcome of cancer treatment in a medically complex um, older population. And, um, in particular, we were able to, um, to look at the impact of treatment for superficial bladder cancer on the outcome of overall survival, um, which is something that hasn't really been looked at um, in clinical trial data or even in respective data within the urologic literature. In terms of limitations, uh, we did have a predominantly white cohort, which reflects the, um, the demographic makeup of our two health systems, and also the um, predominance for um, Caucasians to have bladder cancer. Um, we don't have cause of death data um, for this study, and there are limitations 
from selection bias um, and this being a retrospective study. So our two main conclusions are that cancer treatment was associated with survival benefit in older adults with superficial bladder cancer. However, that was outweighed um, by the hazard of death associated with multiple chronic conditions, which was much greater. In uh, clinical context and future plans for our work, um, this is, is one of the few studies that provides data about treatment outcomes in older medically complex adults with superficial bladder cancer. It's our hope that in the future that this foundation of data to help with decision making for these older adults um, and their caregivers and physicians. And ultimately, we would like to incorporate their goals and preferences in making those decisions. And some of the ideas that we are um, discussing for uh, future work are um, doing chronic condition clustering and looking at outcomes and um, seeing if we could personalize chronic condition profiles um, to identify the relationship between individual profiles and outcomes. I'd like to thank the Aging Initiative for funding this work and my wonderful mentors and collaborators who um, have been instrumental in my growth over the past one year on this project. Thank you, and um, are your slides have come up now. All right, thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Can you hear me clearly? Okay. Well, okay, thank you for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Garg, and that, that really outstanding work. And I'm going to talk about addressing the needs of an aging nation, merging geriatrics and oncology. We'll just figure out how to advance. Oh. Today we're going to talk about the demographics of aging and cancer, the impact of cancer therapy on the aging trajectory, and perhaps the development of a premature aging syndrome. And then we'll move into utilizing geriatric assessment and oncology practice to identify the risk of chemotherapy toxicity, as well as to deploy interventions aimed at decreasing this risk. As we heard, uh, there is a rapid growth right now in the number of older adults in general um, within the U.S. as well as worldwide, and there is an association between cancer and aging. And because of that, what we're going to see from 2010 to 2030, we're right in the midst of it, is a 67% increase in the number of patients who are age 65 and over who have cancer. Um, in comparison, for the younger age group, it's only an 11% increase. So I feel like you're seeing more and more patients with cancer, more and more older adults in particular with cancer. This certainly is uh, the truth. And the good news is that uh, we're curing more and more cancers. I think cancer therapy is um, becoming more effective as well as prevention of cancer. And because of that, when we look at the survivors, what we can see is that young cancer survivors make up really the minority of cancer survivors. It's truly older cancer survivors who make up the vast majority of those um, uh, who have survived cancer, almost three-fourths of them. The population is aging and the number of older adults with cancer is on the rise and the number of survivors is on the rise. And the question is, are we really prepared for the demographic shift that's occurring right now within the U.S.? The challenge that we face is that really the answer is no to this uh, question, and that's because clinical trial data has been limited in older adults. So it's imperative that we really do the research that Dr. Garg had just uh, spoken about so that we can really help to inform standard care for this growing population. So this slide shows NCI accrual to clinical trials, and I'm going to break it down by age, and this is over a decade. What you can see is 
that the vast majority of individuals who are on clinical trials are less than age 65, a smaller proportion are 65 to 74, and even less are over the age of 75, less than 10%. So really, even though I've just explained to you the cancer disease associated with aging, what we know is that there are less individuals who are older who are included within our clinical trials that set the standard of care. Furthermore, if we think about the drug trials, these are the FDA registration trials, and this is looking at a 10-year perspective, over 105 trials, 224,000 participants. Here are the percent of individuals with cancer who are within each of these age groups. These are the percent that were enrolled on those registration trials. So what you can see, again, is this clear discrepancy, most pronounced in people over the age of 75, where we have very little evidence-based data about the newer drugs that are being utilized um, when they're being developed and being submitted for FDA approval, typically older adults have been underrepresented on those FDA registration studies. And then that greatest disparity is for patients over the age of 75, which is really going to be our most rapidly growing patient population after 2030. The challenge that we face is that in these clinical trials, uh, we often are looking at things like disease-free and overall survival as a primary endpoint. And those are important endpoints, uh, don't get me wrong, but when I sit with a patient, what I find is that that's asking me very different questions. They're saying, doctor, if I take this therapy, will I be hospitalized? Will I be functionally impaired? Will I be cognitively impaired? What does my family need to prepare for? and what is the quality of my survival. Length, perhaps, is one thing weighing on their mind, but I would, I would argue that quality and what that quality of survival looks like is even more important to these patients. Perhaps they're even saying to me in some way, not in these exact words, will I become frail as a consequence of this therapy? And if we take this back now to uh, the geriatric world, where you're very familiar with these criteria by Freed and colleagues, defining frailty, weight loss, weakness, poor energy and endurance, slowness, and low physical activity. And if we think about the general population and break it down, and we say probably about 47% will have this intermediate frailty, 7% frailty. What happens when we treat a patient uh, especially with chemotherapy, but we can think of other cancer therapies as well. And here I might even take the gymnast who, uh, this is for real, she is a uh, award-winning gymnast in her 80s, and give her cancer therapy. The question is, do I create that frailty phenotype, slowness and weakness, um, and decreased physical activity? And then what if I withdraw the cancer treatment? Will she get back to being where she was at her baseline. Um, and particularly with adjuvant treatment, early stage disease, when we're doing interventions that are time limited, the question weighing on the patient's mind is, is yes, maybe I, I'm willing to do this for the short term, but really what are the long-term consequences of what we are going to uh, propose for treatment? So the real question that she has is, okay, I'm perhaps willing to do this, but will I recover? So what we really don't know right now is how does cancer impact that aging trajectory? This is an area that, that is uh, for research at this time. And if we even think of normal aging as a decline let's here in functional status, let's just use functional status as the um, y-axis, but we could use functional reserve, we could use physiologic reserve, we could use almost any organ function. We say, okay, there is some decline that might be a consequence of normal aging. The question is, are we putting people on a new trajectory um, or a new uh, aging when we give in cancer therapy? So this is an example of what we would call the phase shift hypothesis. The trajectory of a client parallels that of normal aging, but the patient has taken a hit. So here you can see sort of decline from where they were before, but this trajectory is relatively normal. Versus this accelerated aging hypothesis, and here you can see, yeah, the patient took a hit in functional status from the therapy, but this trajectory now of functional decline is accelerated in comparison to the normal aging process. 
that's important. Well, what patients tell us, and this is an old but very true study, and I think we're starting to replicate data like this, which really says that the patient tells us uh, they would rather die than take a treatment that causes either functional impairment or cognitive impairment. And this was a survey-based study of chronically ill older adults. But it really does show what's weighing heavily on these patients' minds, which is really the impact on their function and their cognition. Now, what we know is that probably our concern about accelerated aging is justified in some way, because when we look in the literature, we are seeing that cancer survivors are reporting poor physical function, poor quality of life, increased number of comorbidities, and we should look at the this kind of concept of really multimorbidity and then cognitive decline. So there is emerging literature saying, boy, we should be looking at this area a little bit more carefully. Now, perhaps we haven't, we patient, and, and maybe they haven't manifested yet these clinical parameters of frailty, slowness, weakness, weight loss, low activity, and fatigue. The question is then, have we a frailty phenotype at either a physiologic level or at a molecular and disease level. So another really active area of research is to say, okay, maybe the clinical phenotype has not yet been created, but have we placed that patient on a trajectory of aging or on a trajectory towards frailty at either a molecular and disease level or impaired physiologic level? And are there things like increased inflammation, neuroendocrine dysregulation, perhaps anorexia, sarcopenia, things we commonly see with cancer treatment. Some of our drugs even cause osteopenia. Or maybe have we, you know, gotten even started really at a very basic level with mitochondrial deletion, shortened telomeres, and the development of inflammatory diseases. Well, literature out there that is suggesting that perhaps this is the case. It's early, but there are changes in telomere length seen among cancer survivors. Increased in P16 expression, increased in pro-inflammatory cytokines, and increased in resting energy expenditure. So again, the literature is emerging saying that, yes, maybe there's both a clinical manifestation of accelerated aging, but also that some of these precursors to the development of frailty at a really biological level might also be impacted by cancer and cancer treatment. So what we know for sure is that older adults are at risk for cancer therapy toxicity. This is shown study and study again, uh, we do know that we are placing our older adults at increased risk compared to younger adults for treatment toxicity. But the real question is, is it at risk, and can we prevent that toxicity from the get-go? So that if I in introduce cancer treatment, is there a way that I can know up front before I ever start with that patient in any setting? And I'm going to show you chemotherapy data, but surgery, um, radiation, immunotherapy are other things that really we need to be studying. The goal is to say, how do we identify toxicity risk and prevent it if it's at all possible? In other words, um, I'm going to show you this picture of the fireman trying to put out the fire. And this is often what we do in medicine. You know, the patient's given treatment, they get sick, we send them to the emergency room, the SWAT team comes down and descends, all the consultants, and we try to put out the fire. Now, imagine if you were a business, there's absolutely no way that, that it would justify that you would allow a fire to occur. Right? You'd be spending all of your time saying, how do we prevent that fire from ever occurring? Because once it occurs, it really requires incredible resources, but most importantly for our patients, huge personal expense. So the question is, rather than putting out the fire, can we anticipate and prevent it? And here, let's make the fire being toxicity from cancer treatment. It's really where we have learned so much from the field of geriatrics. I'm honored to be a geriatrician as well as an oncologist and to have the opportunity to meld these fields and really bring the very basic principles of geriatric assessment into the oncology world. So here, you know, we argue that really we shouldn't be looking at what the patient's chronological age is. I mean, perhaps we need to look at it, but it's just one factor in the piece of the puzzle of risk factors for morbidity and mortality. And that function, comorbidity, cognition, nutritional status, psychological state, and social support, and what other medicines are they taking, all play such a critical 
role in our decision-making process. So really the question is how do we integrate geriatrics into the oncology setting? And our, one of our first studies to try to do this was to really bring it home to, to the oncologist to say, okay, if we do this assessment, can we identify which older adults are going to be at increased risk for cancer treatment and toxicity? And that was our primary objective. And then really also to ask, answer the patient's question, what's the longitudinal effect of cancer and chemotherapy treatment on geriatric assessment parameters? So can geriatric assessment predict chemotherapy toxicity? This is a study that was done where, uh, through the Cancer and Aging Research Group, 500 patients were in the development cohort, 250 in the validation cohort. And study design was very straightforward. It was basically if you're 65 and over starting a new chemotherapy regimen and you have a diagnosis of cancer, we want to do a geriatric assessment before you ever start. And the doctor can be the doctor. The doctor will give whatever treatment they feel is uh, justified for the treatment of this um, disease. And we will capture the drugs and the doses and how you tolerate it and grade your therapy toxicity at each visit. Two doctors had to agree that the toxicities were due to chemotherapy and not due to disease and then we would repeat assessment at the end. The toxicities we're talking about here are grade three through five toxicities. They are we're hospitalized as a grade three, grade four typically are ICU, admission grade five are treatment-related deaths. And we're able to develop a predictive model for chemotherapy toxicity that consists of 11 items. Age was one of them, so age greater than are equal to 72 within the data set was the cut point for increased risk of toxicity. Patients who had GI and GU cancers were at risk, as well as those who were receiving standard doses, i.e. the dose that would be recommended to be prescribed within the package insert, received polychemotherapy, more than one drug at a time. Patients who were anemic or those who had a poor creatinine clearance, and they have geriatric assessment questions that identified people at risk. They are, have you fallen in the last six months? Do you have hearing impairment, which we would rate as fair or worse? Limited in walking one block. Do you need assistance taking your medicines at the right doses and at the right time? And have you increased your social activities because of either your physical or your emotional health? You can see is that the geriatric assessment items are heavily based upon function, falling, being, needing assistance with patients. Oh, there's interesting ones like hearing impairment. Is this that they're simply not hearing us, which is a possibility we talk a lot about supportive medications to try to prevent that toxicity. Or is uh, hearing impairment represents a more complex measure of physiologic decline. So what we did was we developed this predictive model. You can take those questions, you can score them, it gives you a score. And based on that score, we can identify whether a patient's at low, intermediate, or high risk of grade three through five toxicity. As you can see, average risk is approximately 50%. So what we give in daily practice, daily oncology practice, is not uh, benign. These drugs are, can, be, can be quite tough on our older patient population. We also look to see, could the physician's rating of KPS, Karnofsky performance status, a one item rating of performance status, which is commonly used within oncology practice, could that identify patients who are at risk? And what we found was that actually the answer was no. So while the predictive model could stratify risk, Karnofsky performance status could not, and we did it again in a validation cohort and we basically found the same thing. So what this says is that probably, you know, understanding who's at risk for chemotherapy toxicity is more complex than a one-item question. It's something that's going to require a deeper dive, particularly within our geriatric population. Now, the challenge is that as I finished my geriatrics fellowship and went into oncology, what I found was that um, uh, a little bit of a culture shock, because what I found was that while these patients are as sick as the ones that I was seeing within geriatric fellowship, uh, we were deciding to prescribe chemotherapy to these patients, and the volume of patients often being seen within a short period of time was quite. And so I said, you really do this geriatric assessment thing because it might really tell you about how 
how to treat these patients, what I really was told was that there's way too little time and there's too much to do. And this led uh, to embarking on the development of a short geriatric assessment tool that could be feasible with the oncology clinic. And we developed it was we uh, looked at valid and reliable measures of geriatric assessment, evaluated the length, the time to complete, and how, whether or not the measure could be completed by the patient. And then we got multidisciplinary input, and we have a cancer in the for older adult committee that was is in within one of our cooperative groups, and we spent about two years making sure that we really were happy with the assessment that was being proposed. And then we said, okay, is this feasible? So if the big problem is feasibility, can we make this feasible? We found that we really needed to prove it. So we did. Um, here is a study of patients over the age of 65 with a diagnosis of cancer who were going to start on a cooperative group clinical trial. We did a pre-chemotherapy geriatric assessment, the one that I showed you, and we captured feasibility data and then did follow-up and uh, treatment that was as per the protocol. And the news is, is that we found that it was very feasible to include this assessment. And most importantly, the patients felt that it was okay. 92% said the length is just right. 95% said this is easy to comprehend and not upset anything. 87% of patients could complete their part of the questionnaire without assistance. So this is a primarily self-completed questionnaire. Um, three items require a healthcare provider. Everything else can be done by the patient. Three items are a blood OMG, so a memory test, a Karnofsky performance status rating, because that's what the oncologists do, and then the timed up and go test, so a brief me performance based measure of functional status. And shockingly, we were able to get the healthcare providers to do that portion. 94% of them did it without any difficulty. So then, you know, in the field, the question came. Well, okay, if we're going to do this and we tell oncologists to do this, what would be the next step in terms of what should they do, do with the results? So then uh, there was work that was done. Um, we, uh, guided by Dr. Mohili and Dr. Dale, where we did a Delphi process that said, okay, if you find these impaired domains, first of all, should we assess them? How should we assess these domains? And then what are the based upon what you find. So what are the menu of options per se can be utilized um, based upon what we find in the assessment? And then we said, okay, let's build this into a touchscreen version because, again, if we did it by paper and pencil, what would happen is we would say, okay, here are the results, but we need to score it by paper and pencil, and then we'll get back to you to tell you what the results show and how to act on them. And once we had sort of a general algorithm that sort of was through the Delphi and also further developed through sort of implementation teen science, we said, okay, we're being pretty consistent with what we're finding in this algorithm. So we developed this computerized geriatric assessment that can be used to understand the patient's needs and also have a caregiver version as well. So how does this work? So here's a patient of mine who agreed to be photographed, and what you can see is she enters a uh, clinic and checks in, and she's often waiting for me. And um, I try to be on time. The honest truth is she might be waiting there for a while. And so as she waits, the question is, can we take advantage of that time, have our search assistant give her the tablet, it, allow her to answer these questions by touch screen and complete the self-reported version of the geriatric assessment while she's waiting. And then the time to complete this is approximately 20 minutes for the patient portion. And she hands the tablet back to uh, the research assistant, and then we can identify interventions to help this patient. So basically, you can get the geriatric assessment results. They're automated. And then you can also get a list of potential interventions. So if the patient's unintentional weight loss, perhaps a nutrient consult is needed. If they're falling, we consider rehabilitation. If they have polypharmacy, a pharmacy consult, and if they have limited social work social support, we could involve the social worker and get a lifeline for that patient. And we 
we do the chemotherapy toxicity risk score that's generated, and here you can see that for this patient, she had a risk score of 10 to 11. Her risk of toxicity was 72%. That enables me to have a discussion with her, really, and say, okay, here's our risk. This is what the risk is that we're going in with. First, do we want to do it? How does that feel? And maybe if she's got a potentially curable high-risk disease, she's going to say yes. Or maybe if it's palliative treatment, she might say no. But whatever that decision is, we're making it together. We're trying to um, minimize her risk through those interventions. And we have to reassess, really, throughout the continuum of her care. So it really can be done at any point during um, a patient's trajectory of treatment. We take these tools widely available. So on the Cancer and Aging Research Group website, which is www.mycarg.org, we have the chemotherapy toxicity calculator. We've got the geriatric assessment, the full assessment. And then we have now validated this, so that's where the assessment tool is, and now validated this in several languages. So because the catchment area is so broad, um, English, Spanish, Mandarin, Japanese, Korean, and Armenian, and we will continue to validate um, in languages over time um, as, as opportunities arise. So in conclusion, the majority of patients with cancer are older adults. Cancer and cancer treatment may cause this premature aging syndrome. Care patient with cancer does require an integration of geriatrics and oncology, and tools are available to assess the older patient's needs as well as to identify interventions to wholly decrease the risk of side effects and maintain that patient's quality of life. With that, I thank you for the opportunity to present and to integrate these two fields of geriatrics and oncology. And I am happy to take any questions with Dr. Garg. Thank you. Thank you, both Dr. Haria and Dr. Garg, for your excellent presentation. It's such great work. Both of our speakers are now available for questions. And a reminder, you can submit your questions through the Q&A function. Started. Um, Dr. Guy, there's such rich richness in your data set with the details of multiple chronic conditions and the potential you have for a future analysis exciting. Um, can you speak a little bit more about your practice and what are key MCCs or groups of MCCs that you see making a difference in outcomes for your patients? Um, the majority of my practice is super bladder cancer. Um, and um, in terms of the chronic conditions that um, really impact the way that they think about these patients and whether they're um, they're fit or even a, a TUET, um, it, I'll be honest, I think that um, you know, COPD, um, pulmonary issues, cardiovascular issues, um, those are the things that really um, impact my um, my concern in terms of them being able to undergo a general anesthetic. And, um, you know, a lot of our patients are also on anticoagulants for um, atrial fibrillation. We see a lot of that in our population. Um, and also peripheral vascular disease with all of the history of smoking. Um, so all of those things uh, have, have an impact on the decision for surgery. Um, we'll also say that... Um, in terms of uh, providing intravesical treatments, um, we do assess urinary function um, prior to embarking on any treatment with these patients um, because um, it, the um, TURBT can create scar tissue in the bladder and also um, can affect um, ability to even hold the intravesical treatments in their bladder, or it can impact their, their long-term urinary function um, in, in, even after the treatment. And we see a lot of um, nocturia um, and frequency in our population, both um, at baseline, and then that's all exacerbated by the treatment that we provide. So that's another thing, incontinence um, and nocturia are are two big things that we assess as well in our population. And I think like for a lot of these patients, fatigue is a big issue 
depression, or ruining their sleep, or you know, limiting their ability to leave the house um, during the day because of urinary issues, that, that's a big problem and impacts their decisions. Uh, Dr. Haria, we have a question um, about the geriatric assessment. Are, are goals of care included as part of that? So goals of care, um, we have a step now that, that is including sort of weight, like how do people weight with outcomes into survival, function, cognition, independence. Um, and we're just sort of starting to understand that data. The goals of care discussion is one that we hope actually is one that's happening um, with the patient, doctor, and the oncologist. Um, I'm not sure that anything really supplants that, that discussion being in person, but we have sort of like, you know, questions that, that help to um, that, that discussion, and we're studying it right now. We've not formally included it within the assessment online. And then another question, does an elevated risk score ever prompt you to start immediately with dose reduction, especially their functional status is driving their increased score, and it might be due to sarcopenia or low muscle mass? So it's a great question, and right now the truth, the answer is, is we don't know. Um, so while it would make, we hope, empiric sense that um, if someone is at high risk, that the oncologist is utilizing that data to inform treatment decisions. Um, we've not formally tested yet. And I said because I think it's something we need to do, whether or not decreasing the dose empirically is the way to go. Challenge there is is the following. So for it depends on how what you're treating for. So if you are treating for cure, and you are in what we call the adjuvant setting, so no evidence of disease, you're really getting treatment to decrease the chance of the cancer coming back, or Terrible cancer with chemotherapy, then there are times when you wouldn't want to impact the dose intensity because if you do, you're going to, you're going to compromise the survival outcome. So in that setting, actually upfront dose reduction is something that's not recommended. The bigger thing would be how do we support the patient if they want this through the treatment. On the other hand, when we're treating for palliation, the principle of start low, go slow, and uh, makes complete sense because the treatment there are to main quality of life and function, prolong survival with these, and, um, and so it's, it's kind of like you're the coach on a marathon uh, ride with the patient, and you, having significant toxicity will definitely cause you to have, have to, to rest at in the course rather than be able to to really sustain the treatment. So there are the geriatric principles of start low, grow slow really makes sense. And a high chemotherapy toxicity risk score, it would make a lot of sense that you might um, the treatments based upon what you find. Um, I say I'm going to test it because right now we have a study that's a randomized intervention looking at what if we let the doc be the doc we do all the geriatric supportive care stuff and have that expertise on board. Can we decrease toxicity that way? And my gut sense is that there are going to be circumstances where no matter what, unless we modify the treatment, it, um, you know, it, it likely won't help. So I think we're going to learn a lot in the next couple of years through several randomized studies that are going to tell us exactly how do we handle these high toxicity risk scores. Doctor, I, I have a question to you um, actually about um, prehabilitation. That's something that's been taught a lot in in the surgical literature. Is there is there a role for that, like for chemotherapy toxicity as well? So 
several studies under whether that are really trying to get at this. Can we, can we, you know, use prehabilitation to decrease chemotherapy toxicity, or even concurrent um, rehab to do that? Um, and the studies, the studies right now are primarily, though, I've seen within younger adults where they are, or a younger population, not exclusively, um, but where in particular on patients who are getting adjuvant treatment for breast cancer where they're doing cardiovascular training simultaneously, and they're able to see that, yes, they can maintain someone's VO2 max or even improve it while they're going through chemotherapy. So it's a really promising, I think, approach. I'll tell you, is it widely utilized off -city? No. And I think a potential missed opportunity. Um, that's why I think the, the assessment is so important because really we pick, you know, that there's functional decline there or there's risks there and can re initiate rehab earlier for this patient population. Part of it also is just the, you know, the struggle against time. Often you're needing to get that treatment going quickly, but still there's an opportunity always to look at the whole person and to think about would they benefit from rehab or prehab, and it's a teachable moment. Um, so I think it's a really fruitful area of research and could really help our patient population. And I would uh, like to put out to both speakers, um, I think molecular profiling of older patients can help us identify high-risk patients um geriatric oncology cases, and what might be the role of molecular profiling? Molecular profiling, do you mean of the tumor? Um, specify, say, the tumor or, and the individual. Uh, I mean, I can take a stab at that. Molecular profiling is incredibly important where it is um, applicable. And I, so I say it with, the, with that caveat, meaning that understanding in particular from a tumor standpoint, what are the targets and what might be the most efficacious way to treat that tumor is really critical. Um, but, you know, for years with an oncology, the treatment was just therapy. We didn't... We have some examples of targeted agents, like tamoxifen is an example, but often we were using sort of nondescript cytotoxic treatments. And where the field is evolving beautifully, that we're learning more about the tumor's biology so that we can more precisely target what you know, the treatment should be. And I say in some circumstances, because we're now on this in this part of oncology where we are doing molecular profile and profiling, and sometimes we have variants that are identified that we really don't know what they mean. So they're sort of unknown significance. And this is the area where, you know, you just have to have comfort sometimes with the unknown, and um, it, 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 more will be revealed, I believe, over time. A physiologic perspective in terms of molecular profiling for the patient or the host so on the tumor, there's a suggestion that understanding, and I'm not sure if this is what the question was getting at, but understanding like physiologic reserve through things like inflammatory markers, through things like P16, uh, might, might identify patients at increased risk. Uh, there's in terms of side effects, but the literature there is really early. Um, I could take a stab at that from a um, you know, bladder cancer perspective. Um, I mean, bladder cancer is part of the TCGA project, um, although it, it really focused on muscle invasive disease rather than superficial bladder cancer. Um, and there are a lot of findings. Um, from that, that basically it's a it's a very heterogeneous disease um, with a variety of mutations, um, and and that's mostly for muscle invasive disease. Um, 
And so there's a lot of interest in some of these targetable um, mutations potentially down the road. Um, and I think the more exciting areas in bladder cancer right now are the immunotherapies. Um, and a lot of the clinical trials that are be do being done in immunotherapies are also um, look at the molecular makeup of the tumors themselves to determine you know, whether, um, whether the immunotherapies will, will work against those tumors. And I think um, that role is going to expand the superficial bladder cancer. I, I know there's at least one trial open right now looking at immunotherapies for, for superficial bladder cancer, um, although you know, most of the prior trials have been focused on people with aesthetic disease or you know, looking at second-line treatments. So I think that's something that's pretty exciting right now. And you know, looking at some of the um, germline uh, mutations and um, germline genomics could be helpful in terms of looking at responses to treatment and chemotherapy and maybe even side effects. So does anyone have any other questions? Or can you see any questions that aren't appearing on my screen? Any other questions? Um, both speakers again um, for your presentation. What uh, such interesting conversation um, as well. Um, you to everyone participating today and attending uh, our Aging Initiative webinar. Um, if you have any other questions or would like links to a recording, you can email um, Catherine and Zoni, and she can connect you. Um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day, and thank you again for spending your time.